Okay, Jessica. Hi. I think we're live here on Facebook. I just wanted to um, I just wanted to welcome welcome Jessica Corday, who's in uh, California right now, which is really the birthplace of Marcy's Law, the first state where we got Marcy's Law passed. Um, why we do what we do is the interview series that um, that we've been conducting for a couple of years now for Marcy's Law. Um, and Marcy's Law, for those that aren't familiar with it, is uh, started a, a while ago in California where we get constitutional rights, meaningful and enforceable constitutional rights passed in individual states across the country. And um, it's always special when we can go back to California where Marcy's Law started. Jessica Corday is, we have had, um, for those who have watched these interviews before, we have had people on this uh, interview series who are judges, who are lawyers, who are victim advocates, who are doctors, who have been defense attorneys. And there is probably, I can't think of a more powerful woman that I have ever gotten to know and met than Jessica Corday. She is all of those people wrapped into one, including probably a philosopher that she doesn't even know yet. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but J Jessica Corday, um, it, when when we first started talking, I talked to Jessica a little bit about why we why we name this interview series, why we do what we do, and it's because a, a lot of times the people that you see in the victims' rights cause and the victims' rights movement all around the country are people who have been hurt, uh, people who have been hurt to their very core and shaken, um, and they have turned that pain into a purpose. Um, Jessica is no exception. And like I said, she is one of the most powerful women that you will ever meet. Jessica suffered and has suffered imaginable loss. Uh, she's been knocked down many times and she has gotten back up with some serious force and some serious power. She had lost not one, but two sons to murder. She's going to tell us about both of those, uh, both of her both of her boys, um, but also a little bit about how she has gone about not just fighting for her sons and fighting for justice for her sons, but also trying to pick herself back up and how to heal. And one of the most incredible things about Jessica is she doesn't stop with herself. She's trying to think about other victims and other victims' families and other victims' moms. Um, one of Jessica's trademark mottos is fight like a mom. Yes, and, it is. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I want to I want to start a little bit about um, about Jessica um, and Jessica's story and um, just a little bit about what happened to you and your family <clears throat> on April 17th of 2009, Jessica. OK, so my son, Marquise, who was 18 years old, he ended up finding this party that was advertised on that that time. It was MySpace. And it was in the city of Pomona. So he went with his friends. He had, uh, we lived in Diamond Bar, so there weren't a lot of black people. So his friends, one was um, white, his name was Taylor, and the other one was Hispanic. And they went to the party, but when they got to the party, Marquise was the only black. So it was predominantly a, a Mexican Latino party. And there were, these gangs that showed up, these Mexican gangs called, um, one of them called themselves the, the Mexican Tinto Killers, which means black, nigger. They used it as nigger. That was the term they were using towards my son. And they, Marquise was um, asking the Latino girls to dance, which intimidated them and infuriated them. So they ended up surrounding him on the dance floor, beating him up. And at one point, the witness that did show up to testify said that Marquise was on the ground and there was about 20 of them on top of him, beating and stomping him, saying, get the nigger, kill the nigger. As she said, she opened her the door to the house where the party was. The Marquise was crawling on his elbows and his knees as they beat him trying to get into the house. <clears throat> she said <clears throat> that she closed the door and didn't let him in because she said her child was in the house and she feared for her child's life. But she did try to help Marquise and they literally beat her too. They fought her too. So Marquise, she was able to get him up and she told him to run. 
And he got about a hundred yards. And that's when Martin Haro, which was the one that came up for parole recently, he testified that he hid behind a car and he seen my son running and that he waited for him. And when he got to him, he ran out and he tackled him and they started fighting. And then the rest, he said he stomped the nigger and built, beat the nigger until the, the homeboys came and did the rest. So there were, there were several people involved. And as you and I have, um, has, have discussed, there really were multiple crime scenes. Yes, several kind of, it several kind of doesn't make me comfortable. Several is like three. We're talking about 20. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm talking about the, crime scenes not just not just, oh yeah just, there were they defendant. beat him up at the house at that house and then they beat shot stab and murdered him in the middle of the street down the street but they they drug his body around he they took his clothes off because latino gangs disrespect their victims by disrobing them so he had you know been disrobed just completely disrespected and um when they caught him they beat him he had blunt force trauma to the head he had multiple fatal stab wounds, one in the heart, two in the back, multiple, uh, he had got a gunshot wound to the head after they beat, shot and stabbed, robbed him and everything else. They went to the car, got the gun, walked up to my baby and shot him point blank in the head in front of a hundred plus witnesses. This is how treacherous, demonic and dangerous these people are. And had I, you know, because the state of California and the county of Los Angeles refused to be in alliance with me in most of the fight because they went in to charge them with hate crimes. And they were saying, get the nigger, kill the nigger. When they walked up to Marquise on the, on the dance floor when he was dancing, they pointed to, one of them pointed to his neck and it says, Mexican Tinto killers, Mexican nigger killers, whatever. He said, nigger, do you know where you're at? So, and, it, it makes me angry because if they were to have been white kids or cops, the world would have been all over this story. They and they make it seem as though only white people can be racist, and the, and right and racism is not just about black and white. And I tried to push that during the trial, the the process of getting Marquise justice. They would not attach racial hate crimes to the to the sentences or to the fight or to the whatever they charged them with. And that was very offensive to me. So I even called the FBI. I tried to do everything to get every bit of justice that my son deserved. Because like I said, and Marquise went to a party and they've been all white, Black Lives Matter, Al Sharpton, Ben Crump, uh, Lee Merritt, all the black people in the world would have been so angry. But when blacks are killed by Latinos and blacks, they're not mad. They're not mad, but see, when I called Ben Crump and I called Lee Merritt and I called Black Lives Matter, I realized that my son didn't generate big bucks. So they don't care about Black people. They care about the Black people that generates the big bucks. That's how I feel. Yeah, and, and you, you brought, um, and, and just like when, when we talked about um, when people are victimized and families are victimized, they are all of a sudden thrust into a world of the criminal justice system that is so tough to navigate, even when it's working in all the right ways. And in California, and specifically Los Angeles with the district attorney, the district attorney Gascon um, in Los Angeles, this world became even more foreign as you got to know it. Now, there's so many different components to your son's case. Um, he, he was killed on April 17th of 2009. As I said in the beginning, uh, you've had not just one, but two sons murdered. And the date that your second son was murdered was almost three years uh, to the date when Marquise was murdered. And I don't wanna just call him your second son. He had a name, Mar His Mar name Mar Mar Mark Dion. <laughs> and 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 Markion uh, was killed on his 24th birthday, and it was also the first trial date that you were trying to get through with Marquise. 
Yeah, we had three years of their postponals and, you know, they didn't want to be tried together. They wanted to be tried separately. And I had moved back to Kentucky because I'm from Kentucky. So I never missed a court day. I flew out here every single month. And sometimes I was here all month because they had all these court dates and they wanted to be tried separately. And I was going to let them know <laughs> that somebody loves that little black nigger that they called the nigger, but he was my black baby. And I was going to let these people know that you had the right kid, but the wrong mother. There's no way in the world you're going to do all that to my baby. And I'm going to sit back and sing kumbaya and wait for the judge, the prosecutor, and the justice system to do all the work. I had a job to do. Well, and you I had, was going to... Go you ahead. had a job to do, and you did it. And little did you know that you were actually going to have to do the job of many people, um, even after the conviction. So the... The, the case was tried and there were several convictions and by all accounts, um, you had a fantastic, there were 10 convictions. Yep, 10. fantastic prosecutor, uh, Mr. McKinney. Yep. Um, and, um, and, and that, that, that ended up, that component worked out as well as it possibly could have that, that you were telling me in the end, but then, um, several of them were, were sentenced and one of them ended up after 11 years, we'll fast forward 11 years later to a parole hearing for one of them. No, well, you got to remember that same one brought me back to court um, for a retrial. And then uh, because I had already went through six trials, I think it was six trials with Marquise and Marquion together and multiple, multiple, multiple court dates, I was exhausted. So we he had 40 years to life. That's what the judge gave him. Then they brought me back to court again. And, and I had said, look, I, I was just depleted. Do what you gotta do. And then we, we made a deal with him for 15 to life. Then he brought me back again. To, he brought me back for clemency hearings. <laughs> you can, I can't make this up. He has so many rights and so many opportunities at being dismissed from what he had chose. He got everything that he wanted. He hunted and chased my son down and he got everything he wanted. He got his life and he got his death, but he didn't want the consequences that came with it. And the system aided and abetted in him in every way that they could to help alleviate his consequences and his responsibility. Yeah. And and one of the things that we wanted to touch upon um, was the parole hearing and your role in the parole hearing, which ended up um, becoming, should have become even more because of the fact that the deputy district attorney, who just so people can understand, a deputy district attorney should play and usually does play in the way that the system should work, a very significant role in supporting people like Jessica and arguing against the release of convicted killers in a situation like this case. The deputy district attorney McKinney was not allowed by the district attorney of LA, Gascon, to even participate in the hearing. And so Jessica, you had to, on short notice, try to get the file all by yourself and become not just a victim's depleted and exhausted mom, but a deputy district attorney trying to go through a file and see terrible photos that you had never wanted to see. And you actually were tipped off to leave the courtroom during the trial when things like this were happening. Exactly. But you, had to, you, you had to consume and digest all of this um, at the same time because of the fact that no deputy DA was allowed to participate in that parole hearing. Is that right? That is right. And they didn't give me um, nothing but two days, I think they gave, I think they, they, the, the parole hearing was on the 10th. I didn't get the, I didn't get a full week to even know to be notified. And I wouldn't have been notified had John McKinney not told me because the state once again dropped the ball or the county because I had a victim's advocate. And my victim's advocate ultimately was friends with the murderers of my kids. So she derailed me in a lot of ways. And so when I got the notice that I had to get go to parole hearing and then on notice, I said, he let me know that he couldn't assist me. I had to pull my son's murder file because there were so many people 
that played a part in murdering him. I needed to know the role that this defendant played in murdering my son. So I did pull the murder file so that I can read the intricate details so that my son could, I could show up and give my son, son some sort of a fight. But in that process, I had to see his murder pictures, which I never seen before. I never seen either one of my son's murder pictures. And that was on purpose because I needed to be able to move on with my life after this was over without ha having to be stuck with those thoughts and images in my head. So well, when I say, go ahead. Yeah, well, well, you, when you, when you and I spoke and we were talking about this and I and and I could not believe the position that you had been put in uh, without having uh, a, a deputy DA present at those parole hearings and um, like I told you before you you have some of the most incredible quotes that should be all over the all over the country um, when you said I, I'm willing to take down or break down anything or anyone that stands in the way of my son's justice and that's exactly and I mean that with every fiber of my being and that's exactly like, a, like a bull in a china shop believe that and and that's exactly what you did and so so we we, we talked about the fact that uh, Martin Harrow was was ultimately what his parole was granted and like you said before they might have had the right kid but they had the wrong mom <laughs> so, they had the wrong mother so when that happened a lot of times what would happen is that would be that and then there'd be another parole hearing and another case and uh but when you walked out of there that was just the beginning I didn't walk. let me tell you something because after I seen the murder pictures, seeing my son, like I could vision what I thought happened to him before the pictures were seen by me. And I could have, I can, I could write the story in my head. But when I seen the pictures, it, I seen a different story. It was more heinous. It was more treacherous. It was more heartbreaking. It, it was very debilitating for me because I seen my son laying in the street eyes open, mouth open, busted open, back of his head busted open. He had stab wounds in his heart, two in his back. He was naked, his penis was exposed. And I seen terror in my son's face. And when I seen terror in my son's face and I'm sitting before these parole agents who had been instructed to release Martin Harrow because Martin Harrow was a part of a prison uh, reform program which um, the head of California parole, Jennifer Schaefer, is friends with the one that runs the prison reform. And he actually was Martin Harrow's mentor. And I don't care what nobody says. And I tell him and I told her, they're calling in favors on my baby's murderers, on my baby's murder case for his murder to be re-released. So I know that the King's heart is in God's hands. So you can have all the favor you want on this earth, but I had the favor of God, and that's what I kept telling myself. Well, and and the, the other thing that you told me is that, that you're not here to please the crowd. You're here to I'm apply here to pressure, push pressure the, to the purpose. And, apply and, and, pressure to the purpose, and so, that's what I did. But, you know, the way it works, Jessica, after that is you have a very powerful district attorney of L.A., Mr. Gascon, and then you have the only way that you could reverse this is to have Governor Gavin Newsom reverse that decision. So it's almost impossible to do that. So anybody would just say, oh, OK, and I'm going to go on and move on to something else. But you didn't do that. And you didn't you didn't have time to organize any big protests outside Gascon's office. You didn't have time to try to see if you could figure out if you could get billboards and signs. So the only th one that could do that was you. So what did you do? Well, I, I, you know, my son's pictures fed and fueled the fight. So I made up my mind that everybody was saying, just he, he's gonna get out. And I, I just couldn't accept that. And I, I had my conversations with God because even though the world sees that they have power to me, they have no power. They have positions, titles, and influence, and God is all power. So if I had made myself available to God to hear him and for him to hear me, and I had a vision, I had to do this protest by myself because no one was reaching out. <laughs> Nobody didn't care. They had already accepted the decision. So I called my friend up who's in the construction. His name is Tommy Thompson. And I said, can you make me something that can hold the signs for me? He said, get over here. I, he, and he did it. 
So I had a big, huge, huge banner that I had already had from doing a march for Marquise with Marquise's face. So he made me a banner holder. So I had sign holders and banner holders and I posted up in front of George Gascon's office that week from 10 in the morning to three in the afternoon by myself and everything felt right. And there was also there was also a billboard there too. Tell us about that. And the billboard and I put had that up there. Yeah. Okay. So during all of this, I I have I have been unemployed. I haven't I haven't had much nothing, but I had a stimulus check, <laughs> and I paid for my son a billboard to be put up that whole week that I was out there, and it said Justice for Marquise LeBlanc, Restore Justice and Recall Gascon. And I just went forward and I just knew if I could get the attention of the media that the, that I was going to get in front of that camera and I was going to represent my son and I was going to tell the whole world how my son was brutally murdered by this racist hate Latino gang just for being black. I made him black. He's black because of me. So I'm obligated as his mom, as the person that made him black to go forward in the fight and whatever I lose along the way, as long as I gave my son his case, everything that I had in me, I didn't care what I lost along the way. Well, and then on your birthday on May 21st, <laughs> against all odds, one woman who fights like a mom got a phone call from the governor of California. Tell us about that. I got the call from his beautiful lawyer. Her name is Jasmine Turner Bond. And um, it was my birthday and I and I had, I just didn't, I was exhausted. I didn't, it just didn't feel like, I just was hopeless, but I still had hope in God, but not in man. And when the phone call came through and she said, I want to make sure that you still want to, um, oppose Martin Harrow's release. And I said, absolutely, because I think she felt that way because she had seen me in a photo with Scott Budnick, who is head of prison reform in the state of California. Absolutely, I can't be bought out of this fight and I can't be paid to do it. I don't care who I take a picture with. I'm team Marquise LeBlanc, <laughs> know that. So absolutely, and she said, okay, I'll call you back. So she called me back and she said, the governor has chosen to reverse the decision. I th that was by far the most beautiful birthday I've ever had in my life because what people didn't see on the news and what they didn't see in the Facebook posts, they didn't see what happened to me behind the scenes. They didn't see the disrespect from Jennifer Schaefer and Deborah San Juan. They didn't see the disrespect of the people in Gascon's office that did approve of the way he handled things. Now, there were so many district attorney um, employees, prosecutors that came out there when I was in front of that office and they brought me water, they brought me food, they wrote me notes. They even told me, one came down and said, look up at that window. And I looked up at the window and they were all waving to me, giving me the thumbs up. And that was very rewarding to me because I felt like nobody loved my baby. Nobody cared about him. And it wasn't their job to love him, but it was their job to do their job. And justice was already given to him. So I shouldn't have to fight for something that the judge already gave him. And But I did. Judge Gaston forced me to fight. And I'm not finished. I had to rest and recuperate. But I'm coming back into the fight because I am and I got the smoke that George Gaston wants. I got it for him. I'm coming back. He's got to go. He's definitely got to go because I'm watching other mothers. I'm watching other mothers be destroyed. Everybody's not able to articulate their pain into words. Everybody can get up and get knocked down and get back up and get knocked down, already depleted and broken in their spirit. So if this is what God wants me to do in this moment, I'm, I'm here to do it. And, and Jessica, the, it, it really is amazing, the work that you've done and the work that you have been able to do um, all by yourself. And, and one of the things that, you know, that you just mentioned and that we talked about at length that we've, we've spoken about is 
you know, people don't see, they see you out there standing strong. And, but, you know, you, you, you told me that you'd go home and, and you'd be exhausted and you'd look in the mirror and you didn't even, you I said, didn't I, didn't, myself. I didn't see myself. I still and, don't see myself. I see more of me, but I still don't see myself because unless you know this journey, you can't know this journey. Unless you've stood over a casket with somebody that you love with every fiber of your being, and then on top of that, you got to go fight for them because the justice system says that their murderer is the victim. <laughs> you know, so not only do we encounter, we have to encounter, endure, and embody this journey because it's ours till we take our last breath because those are our children. And I want to focus a little bit on you now. Um, because when you, you got inspired, when you said that you looked in the mirror and, and you didn't see yourself and in the healing process, as you said, it, it continues, it continues today. And it's not, uh, you don't flip a switch it, you, you, you felt healed and then there's another hearing and then you felt healed and then there's something else and then you keep going. Um, but what you've done is you've taken all of your energy that you have left and you're trying to think about other people, um, which is incredible. And what you've done is you, you've actually put those thoughts into action. Um, I, I wanna go and, and take as long as this takes because this is really important. What you've done is absolutely incredible. You, you've started something called Headstones from the Heart. You've, sub, you've started something called the Mommy Makeover Reentry Program and the Mom and the Murderers Ministry. and it is um, Headstones from the Heart has its own website. It's headstonesfromtheheart.org. It tells all about this stuff. Um, it, it, it's so incredibly impressive and it's even more important than it is impressive. Um, I, I wanna take a few of those. Uh, I wanna take them one at a time okay. um, because of the way that you described them to me. Um, uh, the, the mom and the murderer's ministry, um, you, you, you talked about the fact that you thought after what happened all throughout the process and the parole process and the one woman fight like a mom protest, you thought you were being loyal to your sons as anyone would by hating their killers. I felt then like told, that, that, that I had to hate, hate them in order to show loyalty to my kids, that I had to hate them. I could not feel for them. I could not forgive them because if I did, I was being disloyal to my kids. And in the beginning, I still believe that that still was okay, but hate wasn't healing me and I needed to heal. I still had other kids. I still had a life before me. I needed to figure out a way to balance this out where I can always respect and honor my children, always respect and honor God's purpose. And I knew that I had to forgive these men. I knew that I wasn't ready to look at Martin Harlow in his face. I had that opportunity because he keeps bringing me back and back. If he's really remorseful, satisfy the crime with the time. But he's not remorseful. He's more remorseful that he got caught. So Scott Budnick, who we became really close. I love him to death. But in the beginning, Baby, believe me, I tore his ass up because I felt like he was disrespecting my kids. And he came to me in a way that I felt I deserved to be talked to and I deserved to be dealt with. So he offered me an opportunity to go into this prison and see me and speak to men that murdered. And and you you talked to a little bit about um which was which was so moving about the world that we live in and how things seem to be divisive um at on, on every level and how the world seems to like to separate everybody i Six did I genders, no. rich, rich and poor black and white and then you thought about this about this ministry um in in the sense that we're, we're not separated by god and we're all under, as you told me, we're all under God's brim and he loves us all. And, and you told me how you thought of these people as monsters at one point. And you said, you know, in order for me to heal, I need to forgive. In order for me to forgive, I need to change these monsters into men. 
I need to see the transformation. And I couldn't see it because my son's monsters kept bringing me the court. So when I went in there, I, I went in there and all week before I got there, I just prayed. I got on my knees and I said, God, I don't want this to be about me because I'm contaminated. I'm broken. I'm damaged. I'm sad. I'm hurt. I'm angry. So I can't do what you want me to do if I go in there for me, but send me in there for you. And I'm going to make you proud if you continue to show me how to heal my body, heal my life, heal myself. So I went in there and I didn't go and I looked at them one by one and I, I could tell they didn't know what I was going to say because they had been already beat down. And I went in there and before I, all the way driving there, because it was like a two and a half hour drive and I, God, just use me. Use me in a way that it, it heals me and it heals them because I want to live. I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. I want to be whole. I want to live in hope. I want to, I just want to be in purpose. So when I sat in front of them and I said, I, I know that I'm not the mother of the people, the woman, man, boy, girl, child that you murdered. But I carry her pain and I embody her journey. And it's not personal, but it's personal because I don't know you, but I know your crime and I know the devastation that you have in, just implemented in someone else's life. But I know that God loves you just like he loves me. And in order for me to get to purpose, I have to heal. In order for me to heal, I have to forgive. In order for me to forgive, I have to change the way I have written the story in my mind. And my mind is, I hate them. I want them in jail forever. I don't care if they died. They killed my son. That's the way I felt I was being loyal to my kids. But I wasn't healing. I wasn't growing. And anything that doesn't grow is dead. So that meant my purpose was dead. My healing was dead. Everything about me that I am purpose to be cannot grow. When I spoke to those men, God sent me eight amazing men. Eight amazing men I have. Dara Yen, Moises, Hereto, I hope I said that right. Edwin Mercado, Pierre, no, Edmund Madrona, Pierre Mercado, Maurice Frazier, Cyrus Roddy, I don't want to miss anybody. Uh, Bryant, um, Rendoza, Jack McFadden. <laughs> He's really special to me. He writes me a lot. Um, I hope I miss none of them. But well, they, uh, I do because they're they're very important to me because they change the way I see my life. And. And tell us a little bit. You told me a story about how um, they, they that that several people have actually contributed to your organization, and that that one person actually went out um, and got a headstone for a victim. Okay, well that's another another man that helped me see the man's transfer the monsters transfer to, transformation to a man because. So when I went in there and I just told them, I said, I don't want, dang, I wish people would done it. Don't bother me until I'm on the phone. Um, and I had to keep on reminding myself that this is, you got to be in purpose. So I got to move in love and God's love, you know, man, man has an agenda. An agenda is a man's plan, but God, uh, a purpose is assigned and designed by God. So in order for me to be in purpose, I had to let him orchestrate everything that I did. So I told them, I want to forgive you, but the state of California and the county of Los Angeles keeps telling me that you're the victim and I don't know how to process this. I don't want to hate you. I want to see you as remorseful and accountable and responsible people, but they keep getting in the way. So I came here for you to move them out of the way and let me know who you are personally. And every single one of them showed me such level of integrity that I told them before I left, I said, I love every one of you. And I know it sounds crazy because I never met you because you guys have made me take the first step to my healing. You put me on a path that, because they were so remorseful. They 
wrote me letters and the letters they would say things like, you changed my life. I've had other victim families come here and none of them were able to articulate what I really did to them the way you did. And they would say, and for, and they all spoke about their murder victims. They never downplayed anything. And one of them said, Moises said, you changed my life. I thought I didn't have any hope. You, you put me back on a path of hope. I'm going to change my life. And he named off all the people that he had hurt. And at the end of that, he said, um, I'm going to change my life for Arnold um, Lopez. And, and then it said Marquise LeBanc. And he said Marquion's name. And that just impacted me. And then one of them said that I changed his life so much that he could feel his tears roll from his heart into his eyes. I mean, the, story, the letter that they wrote me just broke me down to another level of, of acceptance. So they wrote me letters. And then one day I went to the P.O. Box and there was like 40 letters and they all had donations to my nonprofit and they said they wanted to buy a headstone for a murder victim. And I literally cried all day because those people who are there and taking full responsibility, they forced me to take ownership in the things that I didn't take ownership in. And not only that, they gave out of all they had, probably money that they needed, they were willing to sacrifice just to help bury a murder victim. And one of the things that came from all of this is the mommy makeover re-entry program and we talk about prisoners and how important it is and for re-entry into society and that's something that people hear all the time uh, but no one thinks about victims re-entering society and you talked about that when you had that idea um when you saw yourself in the mirror and you couldn't and, and you couldn't see yourself and you thought and i couldn't call nobody nobody cared about what i looked like felt like lived like how i couldn't get out of bed comb my hair get dressed anymore i ain't put on heels in a long time nobody cared about that and i looked in the mirror and then I, i'm friends with so many mothers whose kids have been murdered at least I have access and conversations with at least 30 mothers whose kids have been murdered. And we put on a good face in front of the world because the world acts like they don't care. So they, we don't want them to know that we've been defeated. But when we're on the phone with each other, we're comfortable sharing our pain and how grind out of the bed in three days or I ain't did, I ain't, I'm, I'm sweatsuits and head wraps for ever since I started fighting. And I, the mommy makeover re-entry program is because they have all these programs for them to re-enter and be integrated back into society, but they don't have them for us. There are mothers whose kids, whose bodies have been dismembered and they haven't found their parts, but they don't tell us how we're supposed to pick up from that type of devastation. The things that I've seen in my son's murder pictures, how am I supposed to go back and smile again when I look in the mirror and all I see is brokenness and happiness and defeat? Nobody's saying, okay, here's a program for you. Here's some resources for you to go. Maybe get yourself, maybe get a massage or a facial. They don't have that for us. You know, my mommy makeover re-entry program is I am pleading for any doctor, any dentist, any um, um Class anybody that can accommodate these mothers into rebuilding their confidence. Like some of them haven't taken care of themselves. Their teeth haven't been, we don't get dental insurance. The people that killed our kids, they get the best dentist insurance in the world. They have all the things that we don't have. So there's some moms whose teeth need to be worked on, or maybe they might have, um, bags or their skin is messed up there there's an access we would have access to doctors and dentists that would maybe donate their time for maybe tax write-offs so that we can re-enter the world i want to work again when i was sitting in front of the governor's lawyer jasmine bond when i did the interview to tell my son's story and i'm sitting there looking at this beautiful woman of color and she's sitting in this high back chair this beautiful high back chair with these plaques on the back of her wall and all i could think of was 
how blessed she is and how maybe my life would have turned out had life been a little kinder to me. I don't have the same access to the things that everybody else has. And I want to give these mothers access to their life again. It's an, it's an incredibly beautiful program and an, an, an equally um, amazing idea. Um, and and that, that once again is, is also found on, on your website, headstonesfromtheheart.org, if people want to, if people want to help you support that. And not only that, because they only give us 30 sessions of therapy <laughs> for a lifetime of pain. That's not even a year, but the inmate can get therapy all year long. He can get everything that I can't get, but he's the reason I'm in this position or they're the reasons I'm in this position. And so even we have no more access to therapy. And then you have these mothers who have been strung out on drugs, alcohol, pills, just trying to cope because nobody's checking for us. Even when they're out of jail on parole, they got a parole officer that's, officer that's checking for them, making sure they're okay and they're able to do what they're supposed to do to be a good citizen in this world. Where's our access to that? We don't have it. And I want to give it to these moms because... I want to give it to myself. I need it myself too. I'm still broken. And headstones from the heart, the, the, the reason for the name, I remember you were telling me that the very last gift that you could give your sons was, was a beautiful headstone. Yeah, because I remember when Marquis didn't have a headstone, they had, I had nothing that I had, they had just taken everything that I had not just financially, but mentally, emotionally, physically, it was gone. I was literally a different person. I was in this shell, but I wasn't me. And so I was walking through this cemetery and I couldn't find Marquise's grave because he didn't have it. So I felt I had let him down. And, and how can this be that they can do this to my baby and nobody cares about him having an identity in death. And I'm feeling like I might be on the wrong patch of grass because it just was a horrible. And I made up my mind because it felt kind of like I told you, like when you're in the grocery store and you got your little two year and you look around, and you don't see him. And you're like, where's, where's my baby? And I made up my mind that if all I do for the rest of my life is accommodate these families and put headstones on murder victims, right? There are murder victims out there who have been in the graveyard 20 plus years with no headstone, that's not fair. That's not fair. And if you're gonna give these men, women, murderers access to all these things, make them work and pay for the headstone for the person that they murdered if you're not gonna help us get it ourselves. And even the men that I spoke to in the prison, they agreed with me. And that's why that man, he got out of prison and his murder, the man that he murdered, his mom had died. She wrote him and she forgave him. So when he got out of prison, she had died. And so he wanted to go visit the grave. And when he went there, um, he had no headstone. So he worked, he said he worked for the next three months and every extra dollar that he had, he put aside to get the headstone. And he went and purchased the headstone and he didn't leave his name because he didn't want to offend anyone in the family by that did that was still alive by knowing that he murdered him and he put the headstone on the grave but if the murderer knows the significance in the victim having a headstone how come the state and the county doesn't know that well that is um the, the productive things that you have done um over the last several years, um, given the irreparable tragedy that you've had to suffer several times, not just once and twice with the murders of your children, but having to endure uh, the criminal justice system is, is um, it, it, the, the work you have done is, is beyond admirable. And uh, to, to leave it on um, a, a bright note for what's next um, with you and your journey. You, you told me about what you're going to do in April. Um, instead of having the Emmy Awards, you're having the Mommy Awards. Yes, uh, I am. And I am excited. And we've been getting donations. And I'm excited because, like I said, not only do us mothers have to encounter, but embody and endure the most unimaginable 
pain known to mankind. But then we have to surpass that pain and strength daily just to get out of the bed. And no one is acknowledging us. But if, we, if you can make the most touchdowns in a game or most points in a game, the world cheers you on and even wears your jerseys. But they don't see us. How do you not see me? So I want to make one day, because my theme is called Royalty Reigns One Night, No Pain. I want to give these mothers one night, just one night, no pain. They don't bring no pictures of your murdered child. We're not going to talk about that. This is just a night to, to make some deposits of healing in your spirit, in your soul, and in your purpose. It's, it's, an, amaz it's an amazing idea, just like everything that you come up with. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will say that, um, you know, my, my, um, I told you my mom, uh, passed away a couple of years ago and you remind me a lot of my mom. And I love that. That yeah. do. I appreciate that a lot because I piss off a lot of people <laughs> because, um, I don't have a problem speaking truth to their imaginary power. That's my son. Those are my kids. And so when I find someone willing to tell me the truth about what they see in me, because like you told me that woman, what did you say when the lady said, um, you don't know how to communicate with people? <laughs> yeah, when you, when you were telling me a conversation that you had with somebody along the way that disagreed with you, and, and they said uh, that, that you, you seem to have a communication problem, uh, Miss Corday, and you said, no, I don't have a communication problem at all. It's just that I don't like you. I don't like you. And so that's what's coming that's across. What, There's no problem with that I communication. To you. I don't like you. And then that's how I'm communicating it to you. I don't <laughs> like you. And so they don't like for me to talk to them like that be, because they're not looking at themselves. You're talking about my murdered kid and you're telling me his value is nothing. And you're not qualified to speak to the value of my murdered kid. Unless you've experienced him, you've fed him, you've closed him, you know him. You're not qualified to speak to the value of my murder kid. And I take offense to anybody telling me about his value that knows nothing about him. You know him not. Yeah. So, it, well, yeah, it's it's I mean, when we when we talked about that and and um like I said, when 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 I was a little boy, my um my mom was a um my mom was a uh, was a pediatric nurse in a city hospital in, in Boston and she um my mom lost her youngest sister um, at the age of 25 to homicide mm -hmm. in Boston. And you and I talked a lot about those different experiences. And, um, you know, my brother, my, when my brother eulogized my mom, he described her as a, as a beautiful rose with a stem of steel. Uh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I think of that when I think of you every time uh, that you and I talk. And... One, one thing that you said that I think we can wrap up because it really embodies everything that you're doing right now for the world. So you said, I want God, Peter, to use me to play a part in victims healing, hope and wholeness. Um, and you're doing that not just for your sons, but for everybody. And I cannot- Because love you. wins, love wins. And in order to be in purpose, you have to be in God's will. Because if you're not in God's will, you're in his way. And that's what my son, friend, uh, Tommy tells me, you, you're either in God's will or you're in God's way. And I want to be in his will because I want to live the rest of my life being in the best of my life. I've been broken. I've been sad. I've been shattered. But it's time to, you know, rise. And I'm ready. Well, that's another beautiful quote by you. And I can say for anybody who doesn't know you and hasn't gotten to know you during this interview that one thing they should take away is they do not want to get in your way <laughs> not about my kids now if it's about me you might get some a couple of little hood passes but i just love my kids and i and i want to I, and i love god because i couldn't i'm not on drugs and i'm not on alcohol i'm not on pills i'm not on medication and that is god you can't walk away from a cemetery and leave your kids there and be the same person so I'm either gonna be bitter or better. I've done the bitter. It didn't heal me. The hate didn't heal me. I wanna do the better. And I'm gonna live in my better part of my life and I'm ready. And I thank you for this interview. And I hope that people go and look at the webpage. And if there's some dentists that wanna help some mothers or some doctors or some cosmetic dentistry or whatever that wanna help mothers, please do it. Because some of the things I don't need, but there are so many nut
I think you just went I'm on I'm sorry. Mute. Nobody does a- fitness as our pay. So if you look at the, I wrote my son's a poem on my website at the unveiling ceremony because we're going to not only lay a headstone on the grave, we're going to give them a ceremony, which is their opportunity to walk away from that cemetery and let everything go. So I wrote my kids a poem saying I, I, it was time to let them go. And so at this point, I just want to heal. And I want to play a part in not only the victim's healing, but there's some offenders in there that they need healing too. And I learned that I can love both of us, just like I'm telling George Gaston in the state of California. You can care about both of us. You don't have to destroy and dismantle justice in order to destroy and dismantle injustice. You can care about both of us. Well, you are making everyone better. I feel better having met you and gotten to know you so well. And you and I are definitely going to stay in touch. Definitely. I'm coming to Boston. I want to go to your prison. (laughs) Fantastic. Jessica, thank you so much. You have a great rest of the day. Thank you. God bless. God bless.